an artist who I never, had never heard about in his fair. And next time when he does his art fair, I will try and go and see it. But that is, in the end, the person who got the free Marlena Dumas will probably end up giving it to Simon de Puri relatively soon. <laughs> so please, let's not be hip hypocritical like the art newspaper. You know, the art newspaper is incredibly moralistic about everything, including about money. But of course, it thrives on these things. And we all thrive on many different aspects of the wonderful world of art. And we all live from it in our different ways, whether we're artists, whether we are curators, whether we're advisors, whatever it is we are. And everybody in this room, and a lot of people outside this room, otherwise you wouldn't be here, I mean, you people here, you're all interested in art in some way. And I mean, art fairs, I mean, I would, I mean that's my idea of hell, to be in an art fair every day for the rest of my life. I mean, that would be simply uh, ghastly, but... Norman? Just remember, art <laughs> fairs are not just about money. They are about money, but they are also about art. There Thank you. Are. Is that all right? Thank you so much, Norman. Thank you to all our six extraordinary speakers on either side of the divide. And um, the, uh, Norman, you've lost out on timekeeping, but otherwise, every, <laughs> everybody Sorry about was that. I could totally, go on for another hour, if you like. Totally amazing. <laughs> now, we have to test, uh, now that each one of you have made your case, we have to test each one of you with our questions, because at the end, we will uh, vote again, and uh, then we'll see if you had really any impact at all on this fantastic uh, audience that we have. So, um, I believe that we have walking microphones, and uh, any of you can now ask any questions you may have, so don't be shy. Yes? I'm a student and um, one of the things I found um, striking about being a student is how driven my fellow students are to network and I, and I feel that there's more emphasis put on networking, making the right connections than possibly there is in art. I, art is something I care about, I want it to be a transcendental thing that you enjoy. I don't want to put my energy into networking. And my concern is, with all this emphasis on money and getting ahead, that that feeds down through to um, our MA and BA art institutions where people are more interested in making money, becoming famous, meeting the right rich people who support, who will support their art rather than, um, rather than thinking about the art. That's something that I think okay. should matter. So if I can summon your question as an artist, uh, do you need to be a good artist, but also a good ne networker in order to be able to make it at all? Uh, if you're only a good artist and not a good networker, you may not be able to I think make it. I, it seems to me that the, that the art fairs put an emphasis on, on, the, on money and fame that feeds right. down through to... All right. Um, who wants to speak on this side of the divide about whether you have to be a good networker yeah. uh, to make it as an artist? Ma Matthew. I can. Uh, uh, Richard, no, Richard. You go first. Richard, you, Richard, Richard, you first, start. so let's go this well, way. Well, Rose and I have a relationship, so this Ooh. is Rose that just spoke, so... For once, I didn't stumble. I didn't say we were in a relationship. <laughs> but actually, that's, an that's the first time I've ever heard that. And it's extremely alarming to me, because I have responsibility to not very many students, but enough to care about. And I would never, ever um, put any emphasis there whatsoever. I would say that it, the world is real, and I think I do say that the world is real. And I don't like the idea of somebody, um, in fact, well, I'll take a risk. Um, I don't like the idea of somebody missing a trick, meaning that I think if somebody came to see your work next week, I would say, raise a smile to them, Rose. I wouldn't say, take your clothes off. 
I wouldn't, I wouldn't say buy a bigger Filofax. I would say use your nous. People are as nice and as nasty and as stupid and as intelligent as and interesting and uninteresting as is possible. But you're expected to negotiate that. Young artists should negotiate. Thank you, Richard. We have Matthew Collins who would like to yes, give I, his point. Yes, I would have thought um, that kind of lesson is best learnt outside the art school. And, that, and that's not naively to say that art is in a bubble on its own. It's just that there, it's hard enough to learn what art is, to understand what the history of forms has been, what, how that could possibly apply to um, contemporary life. It's hard enough to deal with that, which is essentially incredibly serious and difficult. And you're plunged into something which is far more difficult than you've ever encountered before, because you've both got to deal with the practice and the theory of this situation. To hear sort of flim-flam lessons about how to suck up to people is really for your parents to tell you, or for you to work out on your own, outside of the context of the teacher-student relationship. So I think it's quite right that Richard hasn't heard this dilemma before, that what he should have heard from whoever that student is, is uh, problems of art, not, not problems of networking. And um, I would have thought everyone in the room would agree with such a common sense view. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> Can we have another question, please? Uh, yes, please. Well, I've, I've been trying hard to swallow some of the impossible things I've heard. The one I'm having most difficulty with is the analogy between the Freeze Art Fair and Robin Hood. I wonder if we could hear some data on the average income of the artists who sold work at last year's Freeze Art Fair. So maybe, Matthew, you are the best equipped to answer that question. The average income? I don't, I don't know their income. All I know is that there's about 2,000 artists who benefited from it. Could I follow up on that? What was the least expensive item that sold at the, at the fair? Do you know that? 50p. <laughs> I mean, it's a huge range. It's a huge range. Uh, the, we, we started a new section last year called Frame. There are 29 galleries there who paid £4,000 each for a stand. They did solo projects by artists. The artists were very much unknown you know, artists. One of them hadn't had a show before, Isabel Cornero. She just had her first show in Paris. She's a fantastic artist. She sold this big, huge installation. The whole booth was one installation. I think it was about 10,000 pounds for the whole installation. And uh, she's a young artist, and this made a huge difference to her. She sold it to a great collection. They had a lot of people coming wanting to give her shows, and she just had her first show in a very small gallery in Paris that opened a couple of weeks ago. You know, it's not all the big hitters that you, th that you read about in the press. Jasper, Don't believe what you read. I believe you wanted to... Uh, just one quick follow-up for um, Matthew Slotto, though. He criticizes the free art fair for not having enough women in it. I'm glad he believes that women should be equally, equally represented in art fairs and that there's an equal amount of talent within the female population. I hope you'll apply that policy to your own art fair. <laughs> you go first, Jasper. <laughs> All right, All right, well, that's a whole other debate. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> second debate. <laughs> so one thing about, yes. about the French section of Freeze is it was very much, it was a strict section of Freeze, it was very much a pragmatic moment because the market had gone very up. There was, there was space in Freeze. Actually, we decided to do it two years ago. Oh. Oh. The, the, siphon, the siphon galleries, off, a lot of those galleries probably would have been shown in the zoo art fair, which is one of the satellite the fairs. We decided to do that before the market crashed. Yeah, it was, well, a, great, I, I, it was a great moment. But it certainly, it certainly looked, it looked like a very it, particular moment. We're going to do it for the next 20 years now. Mm -hmm. I mean, actually, we did it because we did think the fair needed freshening up, but there weren't enough young galleries in the fair that people wanted to see new things. And that we started the fair with a focus on young galleries and young, young art. But as the fair grew up, those galleries grew up with us, and there wasn't room for young galleries. So and we started and so what, if I may say so? I mean, if there's, you know, I mean, if that's what they do, that's what they do. It's just fine. <laughs> And I do happen to know that one of those galleries sold a big installation to the Tate Gallery. I happened to be in a very small gallery in Berlin two days, three days ago, and this gallery told me who was part of that particular yeah. section, yeah. and they sold their in this installation to the Tate Gallery. I'm talking about market pragmatics rather than actually kind of curatorial decisions, and it certainly made good market sense to put younger galleries in freeze at that moment. Yeah, That's yeah, what I'm saying. I was saying. very delighted to hear Jasper's uh, quotes from the galleries about how well they've done. Freeze is a business, absolutely. It's, it, we exist to rent the space to the gallery. The gallery comes to the fair to sell the work. 
that doesn't mean it's only about money. So you the know? debate is over, then. You've just admitted that... Sorry, are about sorry. Money. <laughs> sorry. So the Excuse debate me. is not over. It is not only about money. A business, by definition, is about money. Not yet. It's not, that, so not, you can't say it doesn't mean money. it's only about money. It's about money That's what a business is. It sells it's things. I mean, I think Jasper and Matthew have a problem with the art market. It's, and I, and so I it's a moral problem. Yes, you. Yeah. Yes, you. Um, I think everybody in this room should have a problem with the art market. You know, everyone has a, has a, there's a pragmatic side to their life. There's an empirical yes. side to their life, yeah. an ordinary side to their life where, where they have to negotiate money. And what they hope from higher forms of existence, like culture, and, uh, uh, which takes many forms, is some kind of answer to the difficulties uh, of life, which are very, very deep and very profound, and we spend a whole lifetime trying to work them out. And, and what we object to, if we are on that kind of path, is, is a profound uh, confusion between the pragmatics of life and, and a way of philosophizing this is life. Crap. Which I mean, is what's well, crap. Should, should writers not be paid for their work? Uh, well, should, I, I, should, think you've, I think you've uh, confirmed my argument should, when you say it's crap. Should, when should, you say philosophy or, or thinking about life is crap. So this is my should fault I, because I asked for an aggressive sorry. debate. Yeah. So I'm glad to see oh. we're getting uh, there. I'm I, speaking with the wisdom of a saint. I mean, I'm hardly being aggressive. In a perfect world, all food would be free. Yeah. Well, art, so art deals need, with an imperfect it, world. It's a very rare opportunity to speak to a saint. I, <laughs> and Anthony Gormley can't be here. <laughs> I, I want to ask you, Matthew, um, I, I'm very interested in this idea about pragmatics that have to be like a laminate, has to be peeled away, or is it the other way around, where art is peeled away? In a world of uh, writing, which is creative act, or... Um, uh, going to spend a day in an art school with young uh, art students, um, what do you think the appropriate fee should be? And should that be peeled away or not peeled away? Well, when you're spending a day in, with your young students, you're not saying that um, basically this is a business. Although everything can be reduced to a business, you don't say when you go to an art school, this is basically well, a business. Well, let me ask the question You could, you could get way. involved in other businesses, okay. which would be far more lucrative. Can I just say something? I'm, 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 I'm nearly wait, finished. You, I'm nearly finished. Cool. I just oh, need to oh, ask yeah. a really important question. So you do I'm, have values not, other wait, than money? Well, I just want to clear something up. I mean, my wife is at home tonight. The telephone may ring, and she'll probably say he's doing voluntary work. What I want to know <laughs> is we what paid? does it cost to get out of bed? Yeah, what would you, you know... I, I like to know, what am I going to get out of bed for? What do you get out of bed for? Well, um, I, I, I don't <laughs> think art is there to tell us what we get out of bed for. It's not, it's not entirely... Although, of course, it's involved in this earthly plane on which we live, it isn't entirely about the pragmatics of existence, uh, which no, is what money is. Money is a kind of convenience. It's the tool that we use to negotiate trade and barter and how we cope. Whereas art is a sort of philosophical thing that looks at all the problems of the rest of life. And what we object to on this side of the table, and I'm sure you all do too, because you're all very honourable people, it's just you've lost your bearings. <laughs> but what we object to is a profound confusion. It's you guys who've lost your bearings. Profound confusion between business and art. If, of course they're, they're, they're profoundly different. One is opposed to the other. But they are not the same. See, can I, I would like, the, the thing that I love about hearing you is that you speak so beautifully. I actually just like, you're just, I think the word is euphonious. I love it. And I would love to have a voice transplant. But there is a kind of um, uh, righteousness that comes with it, which I'm not quite comfortable with. And I think you have a potion, which is a delaminating potion, <laughs> which separate where the money is somehow peeled away and then art just floats. Away. But you keep saying this. Um, I don't think any artist, any artist in the world says we don't want to earn money. We just don't want to be told what to do by hedge fund managers, by Philip de Puri and by Matthew Slotover. We want the power to be in the hands of the people who make art, not the people who commission it. And things like freeze, things like art fairs, put the hands in that, the power in the hands of the customer, the buyer, the person in the shop, which is freeze. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to earn money. I'm happy to sell my art. I'm happy to sell my paintings to any of you. I just don't and the want higher the, price, the, the better. to tell me And the what higher to do. the price, the better for you, of course. Of course. They I want won't. money. I just don't want the people with money telling me what to do. But they won't. 
I live in a democracy. We don't get everything told. We don't have the richest people decide how we live. We don't have the richest people decide that they get the best health care. We live in a society, a community, where people come together, where people do things not just on the basis of money, not just because they need to earn a living, but because we have other values than earning a living. If you guys don't understand that, you're cracked. Now we're talking. I love it. Now, now Can we I really go? have passion. We've got plenty of passion at the table, and it's time to get back to the audience, and we have a question about, about to be asked. Yeah, um, if uh, art fairs are just about money, then why is it a threat to this vision of the art world that you have? Well, um, I think fairs are really a way of encountering art, but my position is that they're the least good way. I don't think... Um, art fairs are completely without merit, of course. I, I think they are definitely a, a practical way of encountering art, but they have the least sort of idealism about them of all the other ways, and one misses that idealism. Right, any, any other questions from the audience? Yes, please, madam. Uh, we will bring you a mic instantly, I guess, but you can already start Anna, voila. Hi. Sorry, I, I, I've got the microphone back here. I think Hello. I'm in the most difficult position to speak right ah. in the far corner. My name's right, Tarek. We'll get back I, to you, madam, in a moment. My name's Tarek. I run an organization that deals with contemporary art. It's not my speciality. Uh, I wanted to thank all the exhibitors. I appreciate your having to present quite extreme views, but I can't for the sake of me understand people that I should be defended, actually. I, I don't understand how you can talk about the plight of the artist but be quite so upset about the art market as such. And we've talked about it a little bit, um, but as an example, for example, I don't understand the merit of giving art to a homeless person. Uh, somebody pointed out earlier that they'll just go straight to an auction house to sell it, and it goes straight back into the market. So I guess my question is, what are you envisaging, and is it mutually exclusive. I mean, can these things not work together? Can there not be art fairs as much as there are at the moment independent exhibitions all around London? Why do they have to enter into any sort of conflict? I, why I, shouldn't a homeless person have a piece of art? And why shouldn't a homeless person make money out of art better than um, Charles Saatchi or some other rich person selling but, their work but then We're talking about ownership. And I, I think that another point that I would like to make on that topic is that it's not that rich people are deciding what is good art, they are just deciding what art they would like to own and what art they are prepared to pay for. Um, so it, it separates and it, it does power. create, it, yes it does, but how does that affect other artists who can still produce? Presumably it's a different market. It, it would be the equivalent of going to a very good restaurant or going to a McDonald's, they, they both have their own markets. Um, it doesn't mean that McDonald's is going to uh, complain about the existence of uh, Michelin starred restaurants. So Freeze is the McDonald's of the art world. Well, I would have said something along the opposite, actually. I would have said perhaps some independent cafe is what you're trying I'm to accomplish. That. <laughs> right. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, can we ask you, madam, your um, question? Um, one of the things that came to mind when uh, Matthew was talking about um, uh, the philosophical side of art, um, one of the things that came to mind that we're living through a postmodernist time where the value of good and evil doesn't seem to come into uh, the, sorry uh, into the criteria so there seems to be no quality control where is the quality of judging art and um, so where is the quality of judging art uh, sir norman quality of judging art is experience and living with art and as it were it's a kind of world which you have to kind of take part in, and then you begin slowly, and then perhaps later on a little bit more, uh, I won't say easily, but uh, with more information, you begin to make value judgments. And your value judgments, of course, something that you share with other people. So in a way, there will be certain consensus in this room about a lot of artists, but they'll be different. And of course, the younger the artist, the more speculative, of course, a very dangerous world, very dangerous word in this context. It becomes, but I mean, that speculation about what makes great art is a very tricky and difficult and complicated and difficult thing. And in the end, it's your own instincts that you have to follow. If you follow your own instincts, and if you want to acquire art or make art, I mean, the, the, the young lady who makes art, 
Presumably she wants to communicate her art to other people. Or is she just making it purely for herself and is not interested in the outside world and communicating her vision of the world and looking into places where nobody's looked before and transferring that kind of, as it were, intellectual as it not intellectual and kind of emotional view of the world into something real. And that real thing, has, whether you like it or not, will sooner or later become a commodity. And the piece of art that was given to the homeless person, I don't know, I mean, it's a beautiful idea, of course, but I mean, in the end, that piece too will be a commodity, and I'm sure the guy will probably set, uh, take it as, if he knows about Simon de Puri, will take that piece of work to Simon de Puri so that he can pay his rent or his, uh, you know, the, the kind of difficult uh, uh, existential situation, but, uh, look uh, after the difficult existential Lisa, situation uh, that he finds himself in. the art, I mean, uh, assessing the quality of a work of art is, as Norman says, a hugely complex, shifting, subjective business based on looking at the art of the past, the art of the present, good art, in your mind, bad art. But the market is a very unreliable barometer for quality in art. What makes the highest prices ain't necessarily the best art. And I think, you know, this is the issue that I have. I don't think Matthew's the prince of What darkness. is this word about best? I mean, I don't it's a think, I think, I think exactly, best because it worse. changes all the time, exactly that. I mean, and what's I think best for somebody market, is worse for somebody else. the market, else. what makes huge telephone number prices is not necessarily a barometer of quality in art by any means at all. The market is a very shaky one, and you see an awful lot of bad art in an art fair, and you'll see less bad, bad you, art in a darling. museum, bad for in you, a gallery. Baby. But I mean, okay. bad for you. Know? you. So because there's a filtration a system. Bad art. All right, stop fluffing away, Norman. We all, we all. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of sins are committed in the name of art, Simon.